I finally finished packing my things. I was going on a week-long fishing trip with two of my three best friends, and while I was looking forward to it, I was also dreading it. My friends and I have been together since elementary school. We were probably much closer than brothers and always enjoyed our time together. But this trip was going to be different. For years, we've all done things together. Three of my buddies, our wives, and me. Heck, when we were young, we even dated each of the women until we settled on the one we eventually married. Kenny declined this trip because he had a business meeting the Monday after we left that he simply couldn't miss. He will arrive later that week. Since he wasn't originally going to come, his wife Pam decided not to come until he passed. Then, a couple of days before we left, Don found out that he had to be home for a meeting on Friday of the first week, so he had to leave to get home early. His wife decided not to come with us. When my wife Becky learned at the beginning of the holidays that the wives would not be coming, she decided not to come with us. Well, it wasn't the wonderful vacation we were used to, and I was just upset. Usually, when we went on our trips together, we all went together and had a great time. I usually had the best sex of the year just before, during, and right after our trips or weekends with our friends. I have to admit, I was more upset about missing out on great sex than missing out on being with my buddies. But still, I was starting to just want the trip to end. Damn, I still had great sex before the trip. Over the past week, Becky and I have had sex to the point of exhaustion. I actually had sex when I would have preferred to just go to bed because she was pestering me so much. This is usually what happens before a trip, and I liked it. For the rest of the year, our sex life left much to be desired. Oh sure, we had sex, but it was maybe twice a week, and it was just a way to distract ourselves. It was a big change from when we first got married. Heck, for the first few years we were married, we had sex whenever we could find a flat surface to lie on, or sometimes just a quiet place. Although the changes were gradual, they really became noticeable about five years ago. Over the course of one summer, we had sex maybe five days a week, sometimes twice a day, up to maybe two or at most three times a week. Many times I wanted to make love, and Becky refused. I was upset at first, but after a few small arguments, I let it go. If she refused me long enough, I would take matters into my own hands and deal with my desires myself. Anyway, I was at that point that Thursday night. I sat in the office, drank beer, and took a break from my preparations. Becky was upstairs putting the kids to bed. I heard her go downstairs and go into the kitchen. A few minutes later, Becky came into the living room and sat down in her chair next to me. She took a sip of wine and looked at me with a concerned expression on her face. Darling, she said, I need to talk to you seriously for a minute. I know what I'm about to say will probably make you angry, but please promise me you'll let me finish before you say anything. I promise to answer all your questions, but I need to say it now. I'm scared. But I should have told you something months ago, but I didn't know how to do it, and I needed to get some information for you first. I don't know why, but I felt a pang of fear. Becky looked so pitiful, so scared and at the same time so determined that I just realized that what she wanted to talk to me about was some serious shit. Becky took a deep breath, took another long sip of wine, and continued, I know you haven't been happy with our sex life the last few years, honey. I didn't enjoy most of our time together either. Davy, I love you to death, but, well, honey, you just don't turn me on sexually like you used to, and, David, I want to stay married to you. You are a great father a wonderful provider and friend, but I need more than you can give me in bed. I felt myself begin to boil with anger. What did she say? I knew she didn't let me love her much anymore, but what the hell was going on last week? I knew I had really hit a nerve with her. I opened my mouth to respond when Becky continued. She raised her hand and said, David, you promised to let me talk before you said anything. I clenched my jaw and forced myself to sit back in my chair as she continued. David, I met a man, a person whom I have known for some time, who completely fascinates me, and I cannot live the way we lived in the past. I intend to have sex, make love to him, and I didn't want to run behind your back while I was doing it. I will still care about you, but, well, I need you to know 
that you may not get as much as you think you should. I just don't like being with you sexually, and I need to be with him. He makes me feel alive. It's like when we first got married, I can't get enough of him, and I jumped out of my chair and started yelling at her. You're a cheater, bitch! How could you— Becky stood up and jumped in front of me. She pushed me away, and I fell into a chair. She stood over me and continued, Shut up! I told you that you wouldn't like what I had to say, but you promised to listen to me before you said anything. Now shut up and listen. I sat in shock, and she stood and looked down at me. She continued, I've consulted with Don about divorce laws in this state, and you can't afford to divorce me. Honey, you just have to accept that I will be with my new man. If you divorce me, I will receive at least two-thirds of your salary for alimony and child support. The court will award me the children and the house, because I need them to care for the children. I'll get half the savings and your retirement account. You will become a beggar, and you will not even be able to afford decent housing or food of the quality you enjoy now. Children will grow up in a broken home with all the pain and suffering in their hearts that this entails. For your own good, for the sake of the children, you must accept what I'm about to do. For my part, I still love and respect you, but I just can't continue living with the shitty sex life we have. Nothing will change for us anymore, honey. I will still let you possess me several times. I will not interrupt you sexually, but you must understand that from time to time, I will be gone all night, and I may go on a few trips with my new lover so that we can have some nice time alone. I sat there in shock, feeling the anger rise within me as I tried to control myself. I watched as Becky moved away and sat back down in her chair. I licked my lips and took a deep breath. Finally, I said, You're a fucking cheater, bitch. I thought I knew you. I thought you loved me. But now you're breaking my heart with this. How long have you been cheating on me? Who is this bastard anyway? Becky looked at me with some anger and said, You won't help yourself by insulting me, honey. I hope you can get over your little grudge and we can live as we have for the past few years. I'm not going to tell you how long or when or even where. I'm definitely not going to tell you who I'm having sex with. It's none of your business. And if I find out you're trying to find out, I'll have to do something you won't like. I will say that I had another lover for some time, and we... I was tired of trying to hide it. I finally decided that you need to know. To hear it from me, because I know I can't go on forever without you finding out, and I'm just tired of having to sneak around and hide it. I'm tired of coming home early and cleaning up so you don't suspect anything. I'm tired of never being able to spend the night in his arms. This way I can tell you, I'm leaving, and you can watch the kids while I take care of my needs. As for telling you who it is, I'll say it again. That will never happen. I know that you would try to do something about it, and then you would end up in jail or get seriously injured and end up in the hospital. It would be bad anyway, because I, the children, need you to work and support us. Children need their father to be with them. I guarantee that you will be prosecuted if you find out who my lover is and do anything to him or me. Measures have already been taken to ensure that you will be punished if you make any attempt to harm us. I was again shocked by how calmly Becky presented her information. She was so confident, so knowledgeable. It was obvious that this moment had been planned for some time. She had an answer to all my comments, to all my thoughts. I said, well, I better call the guys and tell them I'm not going on this damn trip. We need to clear up some things, and I have a lot to do. I reached for the phone, but Becky grabbed my hand. Becky looked me in the eyes and said, No, you will go on this trip. The children will go to your parents as planned. I'm not going to be here alone for the next two weeks, and I don't want you to get hurt or try to figure out who I'm going to be with. You need this vacation to get used to it. I've taken measures to ensure that you actually go on this trip, and you won't be happy if you don't go. I can guarantee you will regret it if you change your plans this late. My friends and I have every reason for this. We have informants in the city and almost anywhere you want to go, and if you do anything to find out who my lover is or make any changes in our lives, I will find out and you will be processed. You just have to accept that I have this plan and it will work for me. If you cooperate, I'll make sure you don't have a shitty life. You will live the same way you lived before. Becky walked over to the desk and took an inch-thick envelope from the drawer in which she kept her papers. 
she came back to me and handed it to me. Here. Just so you can trust me, we have prepared a written report of all your activities over the past month. Read this, and you'll see that we've got you covered. We know everything you do, and if you try to ruin my, know our plans, we will find out about it and I will destroy you. And now, I'm going to bed. If you want me tonight, come over. You'll see that nothing really has to change unless you make waves. I sat in amazement. Who was this bitch, and what the hell did she do to my wife? I thought I knew her, and now I find out she was a scheming, cheating slut. I watched her walk up the stairs, her ass swaying seductively. She knew how wonderful, how sexy she looked, and she used it tonight, although this time it didn't affect me at all. Finally, I opened the envelope and began to read. I was amazed. This report was so detailed that I couldn't believe it. Heck, there were things in it that I didn't even remember until I read about them and remembered them. It must have cost thousands of dollars. Was she connected to a millionaire or the mafia? According to the report, someone was watching me around the clock. Heck, they even recorded the fact that I got my shirt dirty one day at lunch and what I dropped on it and the time and cafe at which it was done. They recorded every time I watched a beautiful woman, yes, yes, I'm not dead yet, I'm actually watching, and whether I talked to her. It took me more than two hours to read the report. Then I sat down and thought about it. Hell, there were some things in the report that only I would know about. Once or twice they listed things I had said when I was alone, or with one of my friends, or with Becky. Damn, was there a bug in my clothes or wallet? I sat and thought. I intended to get rid of the cheating wife I had, and I was not going to let her rape me in the settlement. But how would I do that? Damn, I needed to talk to the guys. Maybe they would have some ideas. After all, we've been friends since elementary school. Heck, we even dated the same women and slept with most of them together. I was pretty sure everyone had sex with Becky while we were dating. I mean... The way we all flirted with each other, you could tell we were closer than just friends. Oh my God. I wondered if Becky could have been with one of them. Shit. Now I was afraid to even talk to any of my friends. I mean, hell, if it was one of them and I started planning with them or asked for help, I would have warned them about my plans and they could have stopped me before I even started. Would take revenge and get a divorce. Shit. I heard Becky come up the stairs. She stood up and said, Well, Dave, are you going to go to bed or are you going to sit there and sulk? I'm not going to wait for you all night. She turned and I heard her head back to our bedroom. I never went to bed. I spent the night on the sofa in the office. Becky came in and woke me up as she started making breakfast. She was angry and let me know. Get your sorry ass up, Dave. You need to get yourself organized and ready for work before the kids notice that you didn't sleep in your room last night. When you return in two weeks, I expect you to behave normally. If you cause a split in the family, I already told you what the consequences will be. I am quite willing to meet your needs on occasion, but I expect you to play your part. But you should know that if you find another woman, I will divorce you. I felt myself begin to boil as anger washed over me. I screamed, What the hell? You can bully me and expect me to be okay with it, but I don't have the same right? Not that I was going to do it but why the hell do you think it's okay for you and not me? Becky grinned and replied, Damn it, Dave. We both know what you're getting from me now is enough for your needs. If you go out and buy something weird, it will only be in retaliation. The only reason why I should end the marriage is that you cannot fulfill your marital responsibilities satisfactorily. If you could give me what I need, I would never end our marriage, and I expect the same attention from you. I stammered. I was so angry that I could barely speak, but I finally managed to respond. I just can't believe you. Not once did you come to me and ask for more or a different way to make love. You've never once asked me to do anything in the bedroom that we don't usually do. How was I supposed to know you wanted or needed something more if you didn't tell me? I always made sure that you there were climaxes. More often than not, you had a few before our love ended. How was I supposed to know something was missing when you acted like everything was fine and I was happy? Becky just stood there and looked at me and then said, 
Well, if you have to ask this late, you really are in the dark, aren't you? Besides, my dear, what you lack is not so much quantity as quality. You just never learned how to please me, and I eventually decided that you would never do it. So I started looking elsewhere for what I needed. Now go and get dressed. I'm tired of listening to your whining. I stumbled upstairs and went about my usual morning routine. We had a quiet breakfast, and Sean, our son, asked what was going on. I started to answer him, but Becky intervened. She said, Your father is worried about a little problem he has. I'm sure he'll be back to normal after the holidays. She looked at me intently, then went back to her breakfast. When I got to work, I decided to ignore some of Becky's advice and cancel my trip with the guys. I had to leave straight from work and meet them at our beloved Dennis, where we would all go together. I had a nice SUV, so we would put all the gear in it and go from there. Roger was driving with me, and Don was driving his car because he had to get back into town on Wednesday. I spoke to Roger and told him that something had happened, and I had to back out. I offered to let him borrow my truck to move the gear. Roger said, Oh no, Dave, it will not happen. I just got off the phone with Becky, and she warned me that you might try to pull this off. She said you've been under a lot of pressure lately and have been working too much. She's already talked to your secretary and confirmed that you don't have anything important planned. I promised her that I would make sure you went on this trip. Now, if necessary, I will come and find you. You will come with us, and you will have fun. I started to protest and simply categorically refuse, but then I felt a pang of fear. What if it was Roger? But Becky said she was going away this weekend, and Roger was coming with me. But wait. Kenny stayed home and will arrive midweek. Could it be him or someone else? Damn it, I'm stuck. I really needed to think more and make some plans. I needed to buy a CCTV system, but how? From the report I read, I realized that Becky and her friends were tracking my credit card purchases and phone calls. They even tracked cash withdrawals from the bank. They could discover unusual expenses overnight. I was sitting at my desk, staring into space, when Becky called me, as soon as I picked up the phone, she attacked me. David, I told you that you had to go on your own journey and that it was not in your best interest to try to find out who I was dating. Roger just called me and said you tried to back out. This is your last warning. Do not contact me or you will be sent to the trash trash and you will never see your children again. Am I clear this time? She slammed the phone down and I was frozen in shock again. Roger turned me in. Damn, did that mean he was involved, or was he a real friend and cared about me? Come to think of it, none of my old friends seemed as close to me as they did a few years ago. It was almost as if they were Becky's friends now and she was at one with them. Could this be? No, not all of them. Well, I decided to go on a trip and met the guys at Denny's. We had dinner and they were all having fun, as usual, while I sat and moped. Finally, Don asked me what happened. I looked at him for a moment and said, Becky has some damn stupid idea in her head, and I don't know how to deal with it. It's hard for me to even believe that she's telling the truth. But if she does, my Mary egg is over. Roger looked at Don and said, Damn it, Don. You know how Becky is. She called me this morning and said that her lover is trying to cancel our little trip and wants to make sure he goes. She said he had been upset and difficult to live with for the past few days and he really needed this vacation to get his head in order. I promised her that we would make sure he came with us and had a good time. Don said, Yes, I noticed myself that he has been a little out of sorts the last few months. In fact, he doesn't joke or smoke with us like he used to. I'm sure he needs a little attitude change, and we can certainly give him that. I have beer and his favorite whiskey in the car. He turned to me and continued, Damn it, buddy. Nothing ever stood between us and our stay in the hut before. Hell, I know the ladies won't be there this time, but damn, that just means we can drink more and lie more. I followed them out the door and we went to the stream where we were fishing. It was only a two-hour drive, so we got there just in time for a good drink before bed. The next morning, both guys insisted on fishing and we hit the road. I had actually forgotten some things from the last few days, but by the time we got back to the cabin, I was thinking about Becky again. I couldn't believe she meant what she said, but damn. 
Needless to say, instead of thinking about what I needed to do, I let the guys talk me into having a drink with them. After dinner, I was sitting and sipping drinks with them when Dawn looked at me and asked Ed, Okay, Dave. Let's. You look like you lost your best friend and I know you haven't because I'm still here. What the hell made you so upset? I decided what the hell. If I don't talk to someone I trust, I'll go crazy. I knew I could trust these guys. Heck, we've been best buds since we started school. I told Don and Roger about the last few months. Gosh, about the last three years of my marriage and my fading sex life. And then told them about Becky's amazing performance on Thursday night. After I finished, Don looked at me and said, Damn it, Dave. Are you sure that's what Becky said? Damn it. I can't believe she would say or even think something like that. We have known her for many years, and she is the kindest and most loving woman I can imagine. Yes, me too, but that's exactly what she said, as far as I remember. Is what she said really true? Don leaned back in his chair and said, Well, Dave, I can't say what the divorce will be like, if that's what you're asking, but she's got a point. Like if she actually does something that you say she wants to do, you really need to make a decision about how you're going to handle it. If she's acting standoffish, you need to ask yourself if this is a good thing, breaking up the family and causing emotional harm to the children and even you and Becky. The courts always side with the mother in custody cases. Unless she is proven to be unfit in some way, you will lose your children. She's right that you'll have to support the kids until they reach adulthood, and you'll also be expected to help with college admissions. Since she doesn't work, you'd have to pay alimony until she remarries, and in all likelihood, you'll either lose your house to her, or you'll have to sell it and give her half the money. You'd have to give her at least half your savings and your retirement account, so yeah, she's mostly right. There is a formula for calculating child support, and it usually does not benefit the supporting parent. The court has a strong interest in giving the children exceptional support, so you will likely lose at least three-quarters of your earnings to child support in the event of a divorce. You would also have to provide medical care for the children. Dave sat there in shock. Somehow, hearing his friend, who was a lawyer, say that was much worse than hearing Becky tell him that he would go broke if he didn't accept her sleeping around. I need to know. She won't tell me who she's with, and I need to know. When I find out, I will make sure she is no longer with him. Dave, as your friend, I understand what you are saying, but as a representative of the court, I must tell you not to do this. I hate to tell you this, but it is my duty to report such things. And now if I hear that one of Becky's lovers has been hurt, I will have to report you. My advice to you is to just accept it and carry on with your life as usual. Maybe if she cheats on you, she'll change her mind or put it out of her mind. Either way, I think you'd be much better off just accepting it and maintaining the status quo. Don, I can't believe you're saying that. How would you feel if Shelley did something like that and threatened you? Are you saying that you would just give in and accept her cuckolding you like Becky is going to do to me? Don looked confused and replied, No. I'd probably be as upset as you seem to be, but I know Shelley wouldn't do anything like that. She is head over heels in love with me and knows that I am the best lover she could ever find. I make a great living, and she wouldn't even consider losing access to money or hurting our children or me. Buddy, you better just accept your fate. If she has someone watching you as closely as you say based on the report, she's letting you know you're screwed. If you even try to find out who she's with, she'll find out and do something about it. Hell, from what you told me, she's got you so angry that she might even find out about this conversation. She knew where we were going, didn't she? Shit. I didn't even think about it. Damn, now I have something to think about. Dave was puzzled by the smile Roger seemed to have throughout the discussion and the strangely happy look on Don's face. He couldn't believe his friends could be so unfazed by the way Becky had shitted on him. Finally, he said, Well, to hell with her. Let's have a little more drink. The next morning, Dave got up before his two friends. He decided he wanted to be alone, so he took his fishing gear and walked upstream to his favorite fishing spot. He was just about to start fishing when his cell phone rang. He always carried it with him, but there were many places here where it did not work due to poor signal. He was somewhat surprised that he managed to pick up a signal here. He saw that it was Becky and decided not to answer. 
As soon as Becky left the message, he listened to it. He was startled to hear her say, Well, honey, my sources tell me that you got some really good advice from Don last night. I hope you're going to use it. I love you, and you are too good a provider and father to lose. But if you do something crazy, I can let you go and still take good care of the kids. Now have some fun. Dave looked at the phone in shock. He knew there was no cell service in the cabin and no landline, so how did she know about the conversation between him and the guys? Oh, damn. There must have been a bug in his equipment and someone was there to intercept him during the transmission. He had to see if he could find it later. Dave never noticed Roger and Don standing at the edge of the forest while he listened to the message. They grinned and gave each other a thumbs up before disappearing back into the woods, heading towards the cabin. Roger looked at Don and said, Well, do you think this will solve the problem or should we keep the pressure up for a while longer? I think we need to keep detailed reports for a month or two and we all need to keep telling him to just accept it. Damn, things are going well for us right now. And if we can convince him to let her keep having sex and spend a few full evenings and weekends with us, we'll be miles ahead. God, can you imagine how much more enjoyable it would be to fuck her without the time restrictions we have now? Damn, we got the slut so excited about sex that now she's ready to do whatever we tell her so she can get more. If we do everything right, he can tell our wives about the problem, and we can tell them that we are helping him figure out what the outcome is at night. This will be an excellent cover. Dave fished until almost noon, but his heart was in the right place. He spent most of his time thinking about his marriage and trying to figure out how to figure out who Becky was having an affair with. He also wanted to find a way to end this and take revenge. However, he knew that he could not do this until he found out who, when, where, and he even wanted to know why, if it was even possible. On Friday evening, after Becky was told that her three friends were almost at the cabin, she turned to the man who was with her. She had been horny all day and was more than ready for what was to come. She said, Oh God, I've needed this for so long. I can't wait for the others to arrive. Shouldn't Don be here early on Wednesday? Yeah, baby. Then you'll have both of us for two whole nights before I have to go help babysit your loving hubby. Oh God. I'll be so glad when all three of us can get together at the same time. I just hated being with only one or at most two of you at a time. After what you did to me, Dave will simply never be able to satisfy me again. Do you think we've taken care of everything? I love him to death and he is a great provider and father. I don't want to lose him. Yes, I think we can control it. Yeah, I just hope Dave doesn't start talking to our wives and causing problems. You know... Everything has been good for us for the last three years. I really think we should have been happy with the way things were instead of being greedy like that. I admit, the thought of you being with us all night or during a long journey is nice, but I'm not sure we can put that much pressure on old Davy. We may have awakened a monster. Well, the mistakes we've identified and the few things we've found that make him look bad should make him back off. I just wish he wasn't so damn straightforward and noble. I can't believe we couldn't find anything in his actions that was the least bit insidious. How can a man be in business for himself and not take advantage of the situation to earn a little extra money? Oh, by the way, Becky, are you still keeping track of finances and all transactions like we talked about? Yes, I've been able to get the bank to set limits on what it can withdraw in cash, but I can't do anything about it writing checks. At least we can track them if he does. I would just like to be able to observe the business more closely. Now I regret that I insisted that he hire office help so that I could stay at home with the children and just be a housewife. Becky giggled and then continued. Of course, if I hadn't arranged for me to stay at home, we wouldn't be having as much fun as we are now, would we? I was damn disappointed just spending a couple of evenings a month with you and a few times on the trip. At least staying home means we can fuck more. Now, thanks to this idea, we can have sex as much as we want. Dave was sullen and distracted by the river. His friends tried to talk to him and cheer him up, but to no avail. They got him drunk on Tuesday night. After he fell into a drunken sleep, Don and Roger went out onto the porch to talk quietly. Roger said, 
I'm starting to worry about Dave. We've been talking to him for four days now, and if anything, he's becoming increasingly adamant about leaving Becky and getting revenge on her lover. He's almost ready to explode and go crazy. How are we going to control this thing now? Damn, it all sounded so good and so simple once we made a plan to control him and get her to come to us more often. What if he finds out and tells our wives? Don said, oh, calm down, Roger. I can gut it in the divorce and make it look like she's a saint. In the worst case scenario, she will actually divorce him. And what? The only reason we decided to try this is because she said she wanted to keep the little fool. I have to admit that I enjoy having sex with her while she's married to him. But it would be almost as much fun if she wasn't married. We just have to make sure that he and our wives don't know anything, so that we don't get taken advantage of. We may have to use a little physical force, but that can wait until we see what happens in a week or two. Dave couldn't clearly hear what the guys were saying, but he woke up and heard them talking on the front porch. He knew they were upset that he had been so stubborn in accepting Becky's infidelity, and they thought they would have to convince him to be more tolerant of it. Now he was angry not only at her, but also at them. Before falling asleep again, he decided that he could handle this without the help of his friends. Over the next few days, Dave became increasingly distant from his friends. Roger and Kenny started to get really worried when all he said about the situation was, I'm going to find out who this bitch is cheating on me with, and they're going to pay big. Finally, the day came when they had to return home. Roger rode with Dave again. There was no talking in the truck. Kenny drove his car, and once they got to an area with good cell service, he called Don. Don and Becky sat in Dave's living room and listened to Kenny report on Dave. He's seething with anger. If anything, he's angrier and more determined to make us pay than he was when I got to the cottage. I don't know what to do, but I suggest we cool it down until he calms down. If he catches us, it could lead to trouble. Becky sat there in shock. Tears were streaming down her cheeks and she was almost choking. Don sat with his jaw clenched, his face red with anger. After they talked to Kenny for another minute or two, he hung up and Don turned to Becky. He pulled her towards him and began to calm her down. He said, Becky, you don't need to worry. I didn't want to play hard unless I had to, but it's starting to feel like we have no choice. See how it turns out this weekend and let me know on Sunday night. If it looks like he's going to cause trouble, we'll file a report on Monday. I can freeze all your personal accounts, and I think I can freeze business accounts subject to court approval of all expenses. We can convince the judge that he can fleece you and destroy the business if we don't get control of it. Dave walked into his house late Friday night and saw Becky sitting in the living room. Her eyes were red as if she had been crying. She looked relaxed, like after a long time of sex. She was wearing one of his shirts and nothing else. Passing through the room, he saw the remains of sex on her body. He felt himself trembling with anger. She looked at him as if she wanted him to see and comment. Dave glared at Becky and walked past her without saying anything. She followed him into their bedroom, and when he got into the shower, she tried to come in with him. He pushed her out and said, Get your used ass out of here. I was hoping to go home and sort this out, but after seeing you tonight, I knew that was impossible. You may destroy me, but I guarantee you that I will eventually get my revenge on you and your lover or lovers. After he cleaned up, Dave quickly gathered up all of his belongings that he could stuff into his truck. He heard Becky talking on the phone as he went in and out of the house. One of the last things he did was try to use the computer to transfer money from their joint accounts. He discovered that he was locked out because the password had been changed. His jaw clenched in anger. He turned to see Becky watching him. Becky seemed sorry when she said, I was hoping you would come to your senses and it wouldn't come to this. You know you're making a big mistake, don't you? I love you more than any man I've ever known. I do not want to lose you. If you keep this up, you'll lose the business and everything we've worked for. Just so you know, I hired Don as my lawyer. I just talked to him and told him how you behaved. He will contact you. Dave was shocked. He knew Don was her friend, too. But damn, he was his friend and had been his lawyer since he started practicing. He couldn't believe Don could do this to him. Dave left the house and drove straight to his office and warehouse complex. He planned to live in his office and conference room for a while. On the way to the complex, he stopped at the gate and spoke with the guard. 
I have some problems with my wife. She and her lover threatened me. I need you to call additional security and keep unauthorized persons away from any part of this property. Around 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, Dave was leaving the complex to get breakfast when he was stopped at the gate. A man approached him and, confirming his identity, said, You have been served. He handed Dave the envelope and left. When Dave opened it, he saw a restraining order stating that he could not come within 100 meters of his wife, children, or their place of residence. Also included was an order requiring the court to approve any expenses from his personal or business accounts to prevent him from emptying the company in anticipation of the divorce case, which will be filed next Monday. After breakfast, Dave went home to his assistant. When she opened the door, she said, Dave, you look terrible. Something happened? I need to talk. I need help. And you are the only person I can trust. Sorry to bother you on the weekend, but I have a problem, and I have absolutely no idea who I can trust or who I can talk to. She stepped back and held the door open. Come in, Dave. Would you like some coffee? Dave followed her into the kitchen, where he saw her husband Thedio sitting at the table. Apparently he disturbed them during brunch. There were still plates of eggs on the table. I'm sorry. I think I'd better leave. Thaddeus looked at Dave and said, You look damn bad, Dave. For God's sake, sit down and talk to us. Slowly, Dave told them everything that had happened in his life since last Thursday, two weeks ago. Then he said, I just don't know what to do now or how to even help myself. My so-called best friends have spent the last two weeks trying to convince me to let Becky have an affair. They say that based on what she said, this went on for years, and I didn't notice, so why should I rock the boat? So Don, my ex-best friend, is working with Becky as her lawyer and getting me into legal trouble. I can't even spend the money on my life without permission from the court, and I won't be able to get it until at least Monday. My best friend has taken on Becky's case as her lawyer, so I'm cut off from the case. I'm not even sure I have enough money for food. All my credit cards were declined when I tried to pay for breakfast. Gertrude leaned back in her chair and said, Dave, I just can't believe Becky would do this to you. She looked at her husband and said, If you need somewhere to stay, you can use one of our free rooms. She turned to her husband and asked, Ted, can't we help him a little with money too? Her husband simply nodded his head affirmatively. Dave sat at the table, leaning on his elbows, head down. He had never felt so angry, so helpless, and so determined to make someone pay. Tad thought for a moment, then said, If what you say is true, you need powerful help. I just hope you don't have a bug somewhere in your clothes. His eyes narrowed, and he continued, Come with me, Dave. They went down to the basement floor. They stopped at the bottom of the stairs, and Tad said, Dave, take off your clothes right now and give me your clothes. There's a shower over there, and I'll bring you some of my things. I'll take this to the front door. After you clean up, we'll talk. I don't think anyone in our house is bugged, but they could be watching you here and have a listening device that will pick up conversations outside. Dave changed into Tad's old sweatpants. Then the three of them went to the cement rain shelter under the stairs. He felt stupid when he started talking, and Ted and Gertrude stopped him. They spent the next hour taking notes, planning what needed to be done. After they had planned for every contingency they could think of, Tad left to begin contacting people he thought could help Dave. It was decided that Dave would have minimal contact with these people and that Ted and Gertrude would lend him the money he needed to begin the investigation. Becky was supposed to stop her activities, but they were going to watch her and Dave's three friends for a while. Sunday found Dave, Ted, and Gertrude having lunch together while Becky, Don, Kenny, and Roger had a meeting at her house. After they had finally exhausted each other sexually, they all sat down and recuperated. Roger said, I'm worried about all this. I'm really not sure we should be here today at all. What if Dave comes and catches us? I think we should cool it for a while until we get it under control. Why the hell were you even trying to do this to him? Damn, we've been planning this for three plus years, and you all had to work hard to get him to accept the fact that he's a cuckold so we could see more of Becky. I'm afraid this will all blow up in our face. I really don't like the fact that yesterday he spent so much time with his secretary and her husband and our boyfriend didn't hear a sound from the house. 
Then Thaddeus left and they stayed to watch Dave instead of following him. What if he did something for Dave? Oh, stop whining. We have Dave tied hand and foot. He can't get enough money to do anything, and we have a lot of surveillance on him. We'll know if he farts before he even does it. He's sitting with his damn secretary and her husband right now, crying into his coffee. If he leaves, we'll get a call before he gets to the end of the block. He can't call from her phone or his cell without us knowing what he's saying. They started playing sexually again. None of them saw the man pointing the camera and microphone through the window in their direction. On Monday morning, Dave began trying to find a lawyer to represent him. He spoke to several and made an appointment with two. He was at a loss because Don had been doing his legal work for years, and now he was representing Becky, so he had to find someone else. He eventually decided to hire Sally Hawk. She made a great impression during the interview and was also highly recommended. The first thing they did was start proceedings to unfreeze his business accounts and give him enough money to live on. They also decided to hire another private firm to spy on Becky. He allowed wiretapping of his house and video surveillance. He allowed Sally to begin divorce proceedings on charges of adultery. Later that evening, Tad gave Dave the film he had shot the day before. Naturally, Dave was heartbroken. He got even angrier because Becky was involved with all three of his friends. At least now he knew who his opponents were. The next morning he went to his office and made five copies of the CD. He sent one to each of his friend's wives, his lawyer, and kept one for himself, plus put the original in a safe deposit box. He also posted the videos on several amateur adult sites on the Internet using the real names of all participants. He set up the site as a pay-per-view and money was transferred from an account to a bank in the Cayman Islands. He smirked because apparently Don had forgotten that he had given him the key to his office and Dave had set up the site from there so that when he was tracked down, good old Don would take the blame. Several of Becky's friends and family members received photos of her in action via email. This was all done from the free computers in the college library so he couldn't be blamed for it. He thought about using Don's office for that too, but then realized that Don would never do something like that so it would look suspicious. Using the college computers was really easy. He had done this many times in the past and had never been caught. They were supposed to be for students only and you had to use your student ID and password to log in. Almost every time he walked into the library or one of the computer labs, he found a computer that had been left on. He was using someone else's login, and even if the usage was traced back to the college, it was traced back to that student, not him. The local college didn't use security cameras, so he didn't even have to worry about being photographed in the area. Dave had a lot of fun on Wednesday answering phone calls from people who had seen the video. Later that evening, Becky called him in tears. She said, How could you do this? I thought you loved me. I told you it would only be sex because you couldn't give me what I needed. How could you ruin my life like that? Dave laughed and said, Rebecca, I didn't ruin your life, you did. I am simply carrying out the retribution I promised you if you actually carry out your plans. Of course, I'm sure you've been cheating on me for a while now that I think about it. Of course, there were many cases when one of the guys became convinced that I was not at home and returned late. Over the past few years, I've seen too many things that didn't add up then, but make sense now. By the time I'm done with you and these assholes, you'll regret the day you did this. Later that day, he received a call from his sister, Becky. She said, Poor stupid bastard. I see you have finally found out about your ideal wife. I'm guessing you sent the damn video. Now I think she and I can share the boys. I didn't know she was doing them until I got this. He felt himself shudder when she hung up. For the rest of the night, he heard her maniacal laughter. Don also called, and as soon as Dave answered the phone, he started yelling at him. When Dave heard who it was, he misled him. He managed to get him to talk for almost 15 minutes. Don threatened both physical and legal harm. The best part of his expletive-filled tirade was, You're a fucking asshole. By the time I'm done with you, you'll regret messing with me. I'm going to have your slut wife anytime I want and will have most of your money too. 
if you had just done what I told you, you would still have a family, money, and a life. Now after I break you, I'll make the boys fuck you. I've been having sex with this little slut since high school, and I'll be having sex with her long after your history, you son of a bitch. I hope you like living in the ghetto, because that's where you'll end up when I'm done with you. I'm going to sue everything I can find and blow your money just by defending myself against it. Subsequent calls from Becky's parents were sad. Her mother cried when she asked, Dave, how could you do this to Becky? I know it looks like she hurt you terribly, but spreading pictures of her everywhere was too vindictive. Couldn't you have handled this in a more civilized way? By the time he decided to go home for the evening, Dave was satisfied with his actions for the day. He was almost certain that the computerized answering system installed by his company would pay for itself based on what it recorded that day alone. When he bought it, he was worried that his then lawyer and friend Don had advised him to contact his carrier for a setup. As soon as the phone rang, the computer answered it and issued an alert as the recorders began to work. An alert was sent to all subscribers before their call could be forwarded. It said, Thank you for calling U.S. Central Inventory, Logistics, and Security. All phone calls are recorded for later use. If you do not want your call to be recorded, please hang up now. If you do not hang up and know your extension number, enter it after the beep. If you don't know the extension you need, press Eero and an operator will help you. It turned out that the good lawyer didn't think about the warning or was so angry that he ignored it because all his threats and boasts were recorded after the warning, which he insisted the telecom operator enter into the system. Dave thought this would be epic justice. Unfortunately, everyone in Becky's little group stopped seeing her after the cases were filed. It was lucky that Ted's friend got the video and audio clips that first Saturday, because none of the private investigators caught anything incriminating on video. They did receive a few incriminating phone calls, but most of them were so ambiguous that they were almost useless. One of the first things Sally did was send information about Don to the state bar. His license to practice law was immediately suspended, and then, pending the outcome of the divorce proceedings and litigation, he was disbarred for life due to his threats and unethical behavior. Dave's divorce was granted and Becky came out of it very poorly. Ultimately, she received approximately 25% of the family property. Dave retained control of his company. Dave was awarded custody of the children, largely because of a small photo that was not immediately noticed. That day, while Ted's friend was taking pictures of Becky and the guys in the living room, he accidentally photographed another observer. His perspective captured not only the orgy, but also how Dave's house was built. He photographed the living room and dining room to show a little face in the backyard peering into the house. Dave's eight-year-old daughter watched her mother have sex with the crowd through the patio door. When the judge saw this photo, he awarded Dave full custody of the children. Dave's lawsuits against Don were also ultimately very successful. He won $1.3 million in damages for violating attorney-client privilege and for taking on Becky as a client when he acted as Dave's lawyer. Of course, he was also censured for having a sexual relationship with his client and many other ethical violations that also resulted in fines being paid to the state. By the time Dave dealt with Don, he was nearly bankrupt. His wife Shelley managed to almost completely clean out the remaining family assets during the divorce. Kenny and Pam divorced and she also received most of his assets. To everyone's surprise, Roger and Trixie did not divorce. It seems that she had previously succumbed to the seduction of three friends and was a willing participant in their debauchery. Unfortunately, Roger no longer liked his friends using Trixie for their pleasure. It seems that when they were kicked out of the house, Don and Kenny moved in with Roger. Many nights they monopolized Trixie, and Roger didn't get the sex he felt he deserved. One evening he attacked Don and Kenny. They beat him so badly that he ended up in the hospital. Charges were brought and Don and Kenny were convicted and sent to prison for a year. This time, Roger and Trixie divorced. Dave sat in his office almost a year after his affairs had been settled. She and Gertrude were discussing the latest article about Don, Kenny, and Roger fighting over Trixie. She asked, Dave, have you ever talked to Rebecca? I know she can visit the children under court supervision. Dave looked at her and said, No, we only talk when it's necessary. 
and when it's only a necessary conversation about the kids. I have no desire to talk to her, and if I could get out of this, I would never see or hear from her again. I'm just curious. I mean, for years I thought you were the perfect match, and then... Well, I just always wondered if you found out why she did it. I just can't understand why a woman who loves her husband would do what she did. Dave sat for a moment, looking at Gertrude. He felt his stomach teeten, and then he clenched his jaw and bit his upper lip. He opened the bottom drawer of his desk and pulled it out a folder. He passed it across the table to Gertrude and said, I don't know why I kept this letter. I don't even know why I agreed to read it. Do you remember about seven months ago when Becky's mother came into the office crying? She handed me this letter and insisted that I read it before she left, which I did. Gertrude opened the folder and read the following. My dear David, I know you think that I no longer have the right to call you my dearest, but you are still the only man I love. I know that I have lost you forever, but I need to open my soul to you. I know I caused you irreparable pain, but that was never my intention. I didn't mean to hurt you at all. I never intended to cheat on you either, but I did. I know you knew that I made love to all three of our friends when we were dating in high school. I know that you also made love to all three girls. It never bothered any of us. The first time I cheated on you was similar. You had to work on a major theft of inventory the weekend Don and Shelley were throwing a Valentine's Day party on our ninth anniversary. I was so lonely and I drank too much. I know it's not an excuse, but I did it. Shelley made Don drive me home in our car. Kenny followed me to take Don home, while the other helped clean up Don and Shelley's house after. On the way home, Don kept reminding me of the time he and Kenny both made love to me at the same time. I got very excited. He and Kenny took me inside and insisted on undressing me and putting me to bed like they said. While they were doing this, Don reminded Kenny of that night, another night when you had to work and you left me alone on Valentine's Day. They started kissing me and arousing me. I knew it was wrong, and at first, I tried to get them to stop. They didn't want to, or rather, they stopped. Then the other one started kissing and rubbing me. I felt so hot when I listened to their conversation and remembered how good it was to be with two men. Finally, they pushed me back onto the bed. We had sex for almost an hour that night. I have to admit, I liked it. I had more climaxes than I ever had with you. I knew it was because there were two of them, and they never let me relax, but they were still very good. A couple of days later, Don and Roger came over when they heard you were out of town on other work. I tried not to let them in, but they begged, and I finally let them in. I knew it was wrong, but it felt so good. We spent the evening in bed again. Since then, at least once a month, I had one, two, and sometimes all three, if they managed to escape and you were unlikely to catch us. I know you noticed that, on the weekends and holidays that we all spent together, some of the boys and I disappeared for a long time. We were somewhere and had sex. I don't know how many times we almost got caught. God, the fear of getting caught, almost getting caught, was so scary for all of us. We started talking and wishing that we didn't have to rush and worry about getting caught. Don finally came up with the idea I gave you about letting me cheat. He told me what could happen if you divorce me. I was sure that you loved me enough to let me cheat, and I was also sure that you would never risk losing your children or your livelihood, so I agreed to his plan. I am very, very sorry, my love, that I did this to you, to our family, but I was weak. I became so addicted to the amazing sex that these three men could give me. Please, my dear, forgive me for being so weak. Yours forever, Becky. After reading the letter, Gertrude raised her head. Her eyes watered, but she clenched her jaw angrily. Dave, I really think she loves you more than anything in the world. I know she's hurting, but Dave, she was almost as much a victim as you. I think your good friend Don was a predator. You know, we've both heard some really shitty rumors about him over the years. I wouldn't be surprised if he purposely got her drunk that first night. I don't know a single person of high moral character, not a single true friend who would take advantage of her, as she said. Yes, I know Gertie, but, well, I'm not sure she told me the true story. She always seemed more attentive to Don than I would have liked. I always laughed it off, 
but a few times we fought after a party because I thought she was too friendly and took too many liberties with him, but I never called her or him out on anything that would cause me to really quarrel. I have to admit that after Don's phone call, when I finally caught them, thanks to you and Ted, I had enough doubts to do a DNA test on the kids. You can't even imagine how relieved I was when the test results showed that I was their father. Well, anyway, I believe she thinks she loves me, but I don't think it's real love. It was more of a hobby, perhaps a deep sympathy. It was easy to live with me. I was a good provider and father. Now I think I was the last choice and we got married because, well, I don't know why she married me. I loved her to death, but I don't think she felt such deep love for me. I think that's why she cheated and why she continued to do it. I think she was a selfish person and only thought about her pleasure, her needs and desires. I'm unaccustomed to it. Now if only I could find a good replacement. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.